topic of this video is the Birch reduction. And this is a reduction reaction of benzenes and substituted benzenes. Now, right off the bat, this is a pretty remarkable reaction. We are not used to destroying the aromaticity of a benzene system, and that's it. this is exactly what this reaction does. And it fits in nicely with nucleophilic aromatic substitution because the ring accepts electrons. Keep in mind that that's the definition of reduction, essentially, in the course of this reaction. And so here's a general scheme for the reaction that uses benzene as the substrate. The reaction mixture combines two or three uh, components typically at very low temperature. So the temperature is going to be something like negative 78. This is sometimes supplied in the reaction scheme, sometimes not. And because of the low temperature, the ammonia that's used here is actually in liquid form. So one component is liquid ammonia, and the other component is an elemental alkali metal. So lithium metal or sodium metal are the two most commonly used uh, alkali metals in this reaction, and that is the element in the zero oxidation state. So these are extremely reactive elemental alkali metals, and they're extremely reactive as reducing agents. This is essentially what powers the reduction reaction, the strong reducing power of these elemental alkali metals. These two components are quite often combined with an alcohol, often as solvent, and the alcohol and ammonia are gonna serve as proton donors as we'll see following initial reduction of the benzene ring. So before we get into the mechanistic details, let's kind of take a look at this reaction from a bird's eye view. This results in reduction of the aromatic ring, and specifically the positions where reduction is observed are these carbons that go from sp2 hybridization, unsaturated in the starting benzene, to saturated, sp3 hybridized in the product benzene. And these are the carbons that I'm highlighting in blue. The resulting product is a 1,4 cyclohexadiene, and we can see that if we number the carbons around the ring. And it's actually unconjugated, and that's somewhat interesting that this results in an unconjugated product with sp3 hybridized carbons separating the two alkene groups. It's actually difficult to think of a way to make 1,4 cyclohexadienes some other way, and benzene is about as cheap and plentiful as you can get for organic starting materials. So for this reason, the birch reduction does have some synthetic utility in preparing these 1,4 cyclohexadiene systems. And we can also run this reaction on substituted benzenes, as we'll see, and that leads to products with a little more complexity than just 1,4 cyclohexadiene right here. We'll get into the mechanism of the reaction a little bit later, but just to get the ball rolling, it helps to understand what happens when we take an alkali metal and we dissolve it in liquid ammonia. There's actually an electron transfer from the elemental metal that takes place, and the evidence for this is a deep blue solution that forms when we dissolve that alkali metal in liquid ammonia. And that deep blue solution is due to what are called dissolved electrons. These are sometimes represented as E minus with solve in parentheses following representation of the electron to show that this is dissolved in some solution, in this case, liquid ammonia. And, and thinking of the reaction conditions above the line right here as a source of dissolved electrons is key to kicking off the mechanism. We'll see that in a couple of slides. Where the birch reduction starts to get interesting is when we start thinking about substituted benzenes in this reaction, because of course we could imagine multiple isomeric products forming in the reaction. Say I've got a group, one group linked to a benzene ring. I could imagine that group ending up in one of two positions. That group could end up linked to one of the saturated carbons in the product here and here. Alternatively, that group could end up linked to one of the unsaturated carbons, one of these four carbons that retain unsaturation in the cyclohexadiene product. There is a rule that allows us to reason from the structure of the starting benzene to the expected product, and it's what's known as the Birch rule, because it applies to Birch Reduction. So when we take a substituted benzene with an electron donating or electron withdrawing group attached to the benzene ring, if the group is electron withdrawing, if it's something like a carbonyl, cyano, sulfonyl, anything that can withdraw electrons by resonance, the electron withdrawing group will end up linked to a saturated position, one of these carbons that undergoes reduction in the course of the reaction. On the other hand, 
if the group is electron donating, the group attached to the benzene ring is electron donating, that group will end up linked to an unsaturated position in the product. In other words, one of the carbons that does not, at least formally, undergo reduction. So having stated this rule, we really want to look for the underlying rationalization of why this happens the way it does. And this will become crystal clear, I think, once we talk about the mechanism. But to kick things off, we can actually draw some of the anionic intermediates and just think through those to rationalize the Birch rule. So we alluded to the fact that the alkali metal in liquid ammonia produces dissolved electrons. And these add to the aromatic ring to produce radical anions or anionic intermediates. Those anionic intermediates get protonated, and that's how we end up at these products. After one round of addition of an electron and protonation, we're going to end up with an anion, let's say in the electron donating case, that looks like this. And we've added an electron and a proton from either alcohol or ammonia has gone on to produce one of the saturated carbons. This is one possible anionic intermediate, and it actually leads to the product observed. What's wrong with the other possible anionic intermediate that causes it not to be formed? Well, let's draw that out and take a look at it to see if we can understand why this is. In the other possible anionic intermediate, we would have reduced at a carbon that was para to the electron donating group rather than meta, as shown here. And in that case, that would necessarily put negative charge at a carbon linked directly to an electron donating group. And now we have a situation where we have high electron density at the ring carbon that is directly connected to a donating group which has relatively high electron density itself. So this looks like a pretty destabilizing situation with electron-electron repulsion happening and really negative charge just kind of positioned in an unfortunate location relative to an electron donating group. In the intermediate resulting from reduction of a metacarbon with respect to the electron donating group, that negative charge is in a much happier position. And in fact, if we imagine all the positions where negative charge is primarily located, if we think through resonance, we'll see that it is not possible to place negative charge through resonance type electron flow on the carbon bearing the electron donating group. So this helps us understand why this meta reduction is favorable in the case of an electron rich benzene. This is going to place the electron donating group at one of the unsaturated carbons in the product, one of the carbons that does not formally undergo reduction. On the other side of the coin, if the group is electron withdrawing, we can now pretty easily rationalize why it ends up linked to a saturated carbon in the final product. This is because reduction at the para and ipso positions is now relatively favorable. This is going to produce an anionic intermediate with negative charge on the carbon directly linked to the electron withdrawing group. And it is, of course, possible to delocalize that negative charge into the relatively electron deficient, partially positively charged, all that good stuff, electron withdrawing group. So here now, there's a stabilizing effect, placing that negative charge on a carbon linked to the electron withdrawing group. And that's going to lead us to the observed product after protonation at this position, which has the electron withdrawing group linked to a saturated carbon. An equivalent way to think about this is that reduction has occurred para to the electron withdrawing group, leading to a relatively stable anion. Really quickly, just drawing out the other possible anion that could form here, we can see that reduction at either a meta position or an ortho position with respect to the electron withdrawing group leads to an anion that cannot be delocalized into the electron withdrawing group. The positions where negative charge is primarily located in this anion are the ortho and para positions with respect to the electron withdrawing group. So there's no way for us to stabilize that charge through resonance delocalization into the electron withdrawing group. And so this anion is not observed and the reduction product in which the electron withdrawing group is linked to an unsaturated position is not observed. Finally, let's work through a general mechanism for Birch reduction. And the key starts with the dissolved electron interacting with the aromatic substrate. Here I'm using an electron withdrawing group attached to the benzene ring, an electron deficient aromatic substrate, but an analogous 
mechanism takes place for benzene rings linked to electron donating groups, those reactions tend to be much slower because the aromatic ring is relatively electron rich and does not want to receive additional electrons through a reduction process. So while we won't have much to say about this, we'll just kind of state that the combination of liquid ammonia and an alkali metal, lithium and sodium are the most common, leads to the generation of a dissolved electron. And it is the addition of that electron to the aromatic ring that produces a radical anion in the first step. This structure is a radical anion. It has both a unpaired electron, making it a radical, and negative charge, making it an anion. And this is one of many resonance structures we could draw for this radical anion. I just chose this particular resonance structure for reasons of convenience, really, because what we're about to do is protonate this carbon bearing the negative charge to make it saturated. So the alcohol, HOR or ROH, serves as a great proton donor in this context because this anion is highly, highly basic. So what happens next is a proton transfer leading to saturation at that carbon bearing the electron withdrawing group and a radical intermediate. So we've gone from a radical anion to a radical intermediate and that radical intermediate can add an additional electron. Let's draw that additional electron as a dot and use a fish hook arrow to show that adding it. And this leads to an anionic intermediate. That anionic intermediate is protonated once again. And this proton transfer may be from ammonia or the alcohol, depending on the basicity of the anion and the reaction conditions. But in any event, that carbon gets protonated. And this is where the second site of saturation comes in. So now by essentially adding two electrons and adding two protons, we have added the equivalent of two hydrogen atoms across the aromatic system. That's a net reduction. Now there is another possible pathway here leading through from the radical anion to the mono anion intermediate. That involves a second acceptance of an electron to form a dianion followed by protonation of that dianion and a second protonation to get through to the final product. This is relatively uncommon, but can happen for very electron deficient substrates. The net result is the same. We go from the radical anion following some sequence of proton transfer and electron transfer through to a monoanion intermediate, which is protonated to arrive at the final product.